braved the deluge. Oh, well, there's a couple raindrops, but uh, good to see you. I'll tell you what, I have a confession to make this morning. I have a recurring bad dream, a, a nightmare, you might call it, that seemed, it started years ago, and I have it about once every two, three months. I don't tell my family every time, but a lot of times they can tell when I wake up out of this bad dream. And I have this nightmare, and every, no matter what I do in this chase, I mean, it's a terrifying dream, I cannot get away from the bad guy. I can hide, he always finds me. I can be strong, he's much stronger. I can, I can go and protect my family, and we could go, we could be hiding in the water under a dock, and he will tear the dock apart and will always get me. And it's a frightening dream, and it comes from time to time, and there's nothing I can do about it, and the person that is chasing me in these dreams is none other than the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my nightmare. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you. You make me not want to share anything else. This is... In this dream, he's coming after me, and, he, and, he's, and he's got this, this look in his eye, and I know he's bigger. I know he's more powerful. There's nothing. I mean, come on, guys. Doesn't matter how big or strong. How are you going to fight that? What are you going to do, right? And you feel so helpless because your family's there, and they're looking to you to help kind of protect them, right? So I thought, I'm going to do some therapy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer this. So I went out, and I rented the movie The Incredible Hulk, the 2008 Marvel movie, right? thought this would be good therapy. <laughs> it was awful. And it was not therapy. In fact, I think I started to dream about him even more intently. And, and there's this scene in there where the Hulk is confronting his nemesis. And his nemesis, the enemy, is called the Abomination. And the Abomination is the one guy who is just as big as the Hulk. He's just as strong. He's just as fast. The Hulk has never fought him before, and it leads to this climactic battle, and they are going at it. They're downtown. They're destroying cities. Here's a picture of it right here, and you can see all the carnage around, and Hulk has this huge guy, just as big as him, pinned down, and he is just wailing on him, trying to stop this evil man from committing huge atrocities, and he is pounding away and pounding away, and this works every other time in Hulk's life, and he's pounding away, and that's what we do. He's pounding away, and then finally, he gets a little tired and stops. And the abomination turns his head and looks at him with a smirk, and he says five words that'll make your blood run cold. Those five words were, is that all you got? And for the first time ever, you saw a shadow of fear pass across Hulk's face. Just, just a minute. It's like, because in his mind, he's thinking, well... Yeah, <laughs> that kind of was all I got. I was giving everything I had. I was pounding him, and he took my... This has always worked before, but something's different. Now, fast forward to last week. I'm in here with about four or five dozen of my buddies. We're doing refit. We're sweating like crazy, and I'm about out of steam. And a song, a new song comes on, and Tina's teaching it, and, and, and I'm just like zoned in. I'm like, what is this? This is so hard. I'm hurting, and please make it stop, Lord. And we're going, and we're having a great time, and all of a sudden, I hear five words that pull me back to this. Is that all you got? And immediately, man, I'm like looking for Hulk. I'm thinking, he's coming in the door. What is going on? This, no, no, this is terrifying me. And I'm thinking, Lord, I have this, this fear of this guy. What is my problem? Is that all you got? And then I started listening to the lyrics, and it changed. And it became the most beautiful mantra. It was an Andy Mineo song, and he says, Y'all, I'm going to risk it all because my God is good. I'm on the winning team. They, they try to shut us down. It ain't going to slide. The only thing I fear is God. He's on my side. And I started going, okay, all right, we can do this. This is good. And he's like, man, that's why I know you can't stop me. Is that all you got? Is that all you got, devil? You can't stop me. And I'm like, yes, that's it. That's it. And I suddenly felt great about thinking about the Hulk. I'm like, is that all you got, devil? Is that it? Because we serve a God who calls us to quit playing it safe. And one of the lyrics in this song says, my God is good, but he's not safe. I was, first time I heard that, I was like, wait, what? We run to God. He's our safety. But I missed the point. And the point was, living the Christian life, there's nowhere in Scripture where God says, come follow me and we'll play it safe. <laughs> you don't see that in Scripture. And there's a new idol in America. And it's not the typical one we're used to seeing. You know, it's not sex. It's not drugs. It's not rock and roll. It's not materialism or greed or having a better house or making our life more comfortable and more cushy. You know what the new idol is that's creeping up? The idol is safety. Safety. We crave it. 
We want it. We search for it. We pad our nest. We try to make sure that this is, in fact, everywhere we go in America, we see signs like this that remind us all the time, safety first, right? Eye protection, ear protection, safety gloves. I mean, we, it's unbelievable. We see this everywhere. And it pervades us, and it gets in our mind. And, you know, while we think we get it, not everyone gets it. Look at this guy right here who's actually putting up the safety first banner. He just, this, no, no, he doesn't get it. What is, you, I applaud his effort. But how about this next one? Look at this. This is so, this is an actual shot of guys sitting under a backhoe, suspended in the air, rickety, because I want to stay out of the sun. <laughs> Avoid those harmful UV rays. Not everybody gets it. Safety first. But it is in our minds, right? We see this. We think this. We think safety first. This is one of those things. There's a pastor named Scott Dudley, and he recently commented how he noticed over the past 30 years, we have inadvertently created the most risk-averse society in history. Think about it. We are the most seat-belted, bike-helmeted, knee-pad-wearing, Airbag, gluten free, hand sanitized, sunscreen slathered, over medicated, password protected, valet park, security system, inoculated generation in history. Where's the Tylenol? I mean, it is one of those things where you, you look around and we, we do it all. I don't even let my kids go outside without knee pads and helmets and stuff, and that's just to get the mail. <laughs> right? I mean, you all know this. My nickname is Safety Pup for a reason. I honestly, I wonder. Has all of this safety stuff, has it only made everybody more afraid of everything, right? We look around and we think, oh, don't do that. Watch out over there. Milo, stop. <laughs> get down. Get out of the street, you know. And then, hear me, I am not talking about taking risk for risk's sake. You know that. I'm safety pup. That is not it. But I can get to the point where I'm starting to realize that this new idol of safety can hamper our faith. It can hamper our faith. It can paralyze us and give us a, a, almost a spirit of fear. Where we don't want to try anything. Why? Because it's risky. We don't want to try anything new. We don't think about this. Most Christians today, most, not, not you, but out there, other, most Christians don't serve today. You know that? You know why? Because it might not be safe. Most Christians today don't share their faith. They don't take a stand because... It might not be safe. Most Christians today, most, not all, not you, most Christians today don't tithe. They don't lift a finger to shoulder the burden of the kingdom. Why? Say it with me. It might not be safe. Most Christians today don't get out of their rut and break bad habits and repent of sin. And they don't take risks and they don't go dream big dreams for the Lord. Why? Because it might not be safe. And we buy into this mentality. And you ever notice when you get something in the mail that promises adventure, your first reaction is like, woo, great. You ever get those mail outs like, your, your, your invitation to adventure awaits. And, you can't, and you're like, I can't wait. You know, I'm going to call, what is this? Is, is it a trip to the Amazon? Is it, is it hang gliding lessons? You know, sign me up. Is it indoor skydiving or outdoor skydiving? Is it, is it maybe like going on an African safari? What is it? You're so excited. You got the kids. You gather around. You open it up, and it's coupons for the mall. You're like, that, no, that's not, that is not my idea of adventure. That is not what I believe God is calling us to. If you are looking for more out of life than a trip to Cary Town Center, you are in the right place today. If you are looking for more out of life than slowly getting through it with no scars and then crawling into your grave and pulling the dirt over you safely, you came to the right place today. If you want to arrive at the end of life and have your tombstone read more than, phew, that was relatively safe. Glad I made it. If you want more out of that, today is your day. This is the message for you. In fact, we might take two weeks on this. We're going to look at an example today, probably one of the most famous examples of a great Bible hero getting out of his comfort zone and refusing to play it safe. And if you're up for that, this picture right here, my graphic today that I picked, might give you a hint of a great disciple who literally had an encounter that no one had ever done, and then he takes his eyes off the Lord and he begins to sink, and he starts to falter. Does that give you a little hint of what we're going to dive into today? Hmm? See what I did there? I gave you another hint. 
I want to set the context for this because historical context is everything. But go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 14. Pull up your Bible app. Look at Matthew 14, but don't read it yet, okay? I want to share something with you. I want to bring you up to speed as to what's happened up to this point. Here we have Jesus, and he's been doing all kinds of miracles, and he's gathered everybody around on this mountainside. Everybody's hungry, okay? This is what happens right before we read this great story. He says, sit them down, let's feed them. How much food you got? They go, we got like five loaves and two fish. And he goes, perfect, that's just enough. And he goes and he feeds a few people. And by few, I mean like 5,000 men, probably four or 5,000 women, and not counting the children, however many that was. So we're anywhere from 15, 20,000 people. He feeds them with that. It's this huge miracle, and people are, are just amazed. Then at the end, almost as if to bolster the disciples' faith, he says, I want you to go collect the leftovers. What? <laughs> There's leftovers? And they go get 12 baskets full of leftovers so they can cook them up in the crock pot later. And they've got these baskets. No, it's 12 of them for 12 disciples, right? Think about this faith factor. And he comes back, and he says, okay, guys, party's over. Everybody go home. And he sends them on their way, and Jesus and the disciples turn to leave and go somewhere else. And that's where we pick up the story. Read with me verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat, this is with the disciples, were now in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. This is one of those things, two steps forward, one step back. It was boisterous, it was wild, and and we'll get into that. But now, verse 25, in the fourth watch of the night, that's around 3 a.m. to 6 6 a.m., okay? That's the darkest, darkest part of the night. The disciples see him walking on the sea, and they were troubled. And when the disciples saw this, they looked and they said, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, guys, be of good cheer. It's me, okay? Don't be afraid. Peter answered, I love this. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. I love Jesus' response. Jesus' response is like, all right, come. You know, I mean, it's like, wow, is this going to happen? This is happening. And Peter, he gets down out of the boat. shows you the size of the boat that he actually gets down to get into the water. It's not like a little canoe where he just kind of goes over the edge. He gets down out of the boat, and he walks on the water to go to Jesus. Doesn't stop there. We love this next part. We love to point this out. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous and he was afraid, he began to sink, and he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, I love that, Jesus stretched out his hand, and he caught him. And he said to him, oh, you of little faith, Why'd you doubt? And when he got back into the boat, then the wind ceased. I love that. Just get still. And those who were in the boat, they came and they worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Powerful story. Incredible story. There's something so ironic about this. We want to play things safe. But ironically, there are risks to playing it safe. There are risks involved when we try to pull our cards in and we try to not, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to wear a helmet. I'm going to put on sunscreen. You know, the sun's bad. I'm going to do all these things. There are dangers of playing it safe. And I want to share a few biblical steps here of shattering all these idols of safety, of playing it safe at every cost. But first, we're going to look at some of the warnings that we see from Scripture. The first one, and you want to write this down, is playing it safe limits our impact. As I stewed on this all week long, I started looking at how this affected in my own life. Playing it safe limits our impact because it sends you down this road of fear. Anybody ever been there? I can't do that. Well, this will happen. We don't, we don't have the resources to do that. Well, surely God's not calling me to do that because that's like insane. That's like way risky. That would, that would be miraculous. Y'all know I am a recovering safety-holic. If given two options, I will almost always choose the safer option. Almost always. Maybe you're like that too. And as I look at this, I can't help but ask myself, am I missing out on any God-honoring risks that he's calling me to take because of my love for safety? I can't help but think, you know, the impact I can make and how much more unleashed it would be if I got rid of those handcuffs of fear. If I was willing to stand up and do something larger than I could do in my flesh. 
If I can do something bigger for the kingdom because my fear and wanting to play it safe is holding me back, which leads us to warning number two. Playing it safe shrinks my faith. This is so, so powerful. Remember, we can't find a single verse in all of God's Word where Jesus says, come, follow me, and together we'll play it safe. It doesn't happen. Let me have my friends bring up my, uh, my next illustration here. I want to I share something. One of my all-time favorite leaders is Francis Chan. And if you haven't seen this going around YouTube in the last few years, this thing is amazing. This is one of the coolest things. He's at a conference, and he's speaking to other Christians, a lot of leaders. And he's sharing this incredible story about how we need to stop living comfortable lives with no real failures, but no real accomplishments. And I love this. Yes. Oh, I can't wait to show you my prowess on the balance beam, church. Yeah. Get out your cameras. He goes on and he's saying, guys, imagine you're at the Olympics, okay? And you have trained all your life and you're gifted with talents. And God has given you not only physical talents, but he's given you physical treasure to afford the training to get to this moment. And you're at the Olympics and you are there and you are so fired. You have an awesome, inspiring, impressive, risk-filled routine. And you have been working on it since you were like four. And here you are and the judges are there on the front row and they got their cards. What's it going to be? 9.5, 9.9, 10, who knows? And just as you're getting ready to get up and the judges start your clock, Oh, boy. <laughs> See how risky this is? huh? Just as you get ready to go, you look at the judges, and you nod, and you begin your routine, and the clock starts ticking. you got 90 seconds, maybe two minutes. Your whole life has led to this moment, and you're getting ready, and all of a sudden, fear overwhelms you, and you say, you know what? I'm not going to do my big routine. I'm just going to wait it out. I'm just, in fact, I'm just going to sit down right here on the beam. I'm just going to sit here, and I see the clock ticking, and it's, it's going to be okay, and smile to the judges. like, I made it. <laughs> I'm here. I mean, that's got to be worth something, right? And then you think, well, you know what? This isn't even safe. I should probably, I should probably do something more safety conscious here. I'm going to go ahead and put on my helmet. We're going to we're just going to lay down. You know what? I'm just going to lay down on this. I'm going to hold this beam. And I'm just going to, I'm going to be safe this way. Nothing bad could possibly happen. And we lay here and we think, I'm just going to ride this out because it's safe and no harm could come. And we liken it to the Christian life. We think, you know what, God, I'm, I got me and my family and that's enough. I'm risk averse. I, I'm lactose intolerant. And I, got, I, can't, I, I, know, I can't do anything for you, God. So I'm just going to rub this little bee here. I got my family. We're going to go to church. I'm going to homeschool my kids, and I mean, we're, when they go outside, I'm going to wrap them in bubble wrap. I'm going to make sure we only eat, like, organic snails from the backyard, God. It's going to be awesome, and I'm going to play it safe, and when I get to church, I'm going to sit with them, and we're going to be safe, and, you know, if I'm feeling really spiritual, I might give, like, 2% of my income to support your kingdom work, Lord, and, you know, just don't ask me to serve in the nursery, because that's really evil, and, <laughs> well, maybe if I'm feeling spiritual, I might do that, Lord, and then we get, we get to the end of our life. And seriously, y'all, we get to the end of our life, and we're like, I've almost made it. But I have one more request, God. Please, dear sweet baby Jesus, if, I know this is asking for a lot, but is there any way I could just go in my sleep? If I could just, if I could just close my eyes and wake up in your presence, dear Lord, that'd be awesome. So we finish our routine. Imagine the Olympian hugging the balance beam for two minutes. And then he dismounts and he thrusts his fists in the air as if he's done something awesome. And you hear crickets. And you look at the judge and you're shocked when they hold up a score of 0.0001. And you get the 0.0001 just because apparently you didn't die on the beam. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't even, it's not worth anything. And then I wonder how many of us do the same thing. We get through life. We've played it so safe. We just, we like get before the throne. We're like, ha, I made it. <laughs> I'm so happy I made it, Lord. And we look at him and we go, that was a tough ride. But I made it with no scars. Not even a scratch. Not even a dent. And then we look at Jesus. And we see his scars. And how he didn't play it safe for us. 
went to the cross. I look at all this and I think, there is no passage in the Bible where God calls someone to do anything great that is safe. Not one. Jesus goes to the cross. You see David goes and takes on a giant. Moses goes and confronts Pharaoh. Is he crazy? We see even, even the ladies, we've got Esther going, putting her life in grave danger to go try to persuade a king who is not hearing it. Over and over. And then we see Peter, the great Peter, who gets out of a perfectly good boat to take a huge risk to do what no one had ever done. Not even the prophets. But that's when the magic happened for him. It was amazing. You see, we're great. We love being in the boat. It's safe. We love the harbor. If we could just stay in the harbor, that's awesome. But that's not what ships are built for. Nobody gets in the harbor and goes, whoo, this is great. You want to take it out? Oh, no, no, no. We got to stay anchored right here. A little jet ski went by over there behind Mr. Rayner, and there's a wake. There's a little wake. And hold tight. Get, get out the helmets. Right? That's not what boats are built for. That's not what it's about. We, when we take risks, we see that God could come through for us. And it builds our faith. When he can do what we can't do in our flesh. Ooh, this is getting tough. Brings us to lesson number three. Playing it safe stunts our growth. Ooh, boy, howdy does it stunt our growth. See, our faith doesn't deepen. And when we don't challenge ourselves, and we don't get that, that, that stretching that we need, we risk not being able to fall deeper in love with God. I just read this week about a church who's going on a mission trip. They were planning about going to a very dangerous part of Central America, somewhere in Mexico. And a man, a father, went to the pastor. And he went up to him and he said, I want to talk to you, pastor, because I'm thinking about letting my 15-year-old daughter go with you on this dangerous mission trip to Mexico. But before I do, I just need to ask you one question. Can you guarantee me it will be safe? You're all shaking your heads. You know he can't do that. I, do you understand where the parent's coming from? Absolutely. Safety pup understands. I don't like my kids putting up the flags at the end of the road because I'm scared they're going to get abducted, right? So I get this. I understand where the guy's questions come from. But the pastor looked him in the eye and he goes, <laughs> no. No, I can't guarantee complete, total safety. I can't do that. But I can guarantee you this. It is going to be much safer for your daughter to be in God's will and go serve him in Mexico than it is for her to stay right here and turn down something he's calling her to do. You see, if she goes and she learns to trust God and she goes public with her faith and she learns to put others first and she learns to say no to selfishness and serve the poor and develop a heart of generosity and love where she actually has to depend on God and get out of her comfort zone, that is going to be so much more safe for her then staying here in America where she never stretches her faith, where she never has community outside of what she's used to, where she probably thinks she really doesn't even need to rely on God. That father's eyes were like this, he said. It's like, that was not the answer I was expecting. So the pastor went on. He goes, listen, I'm not trying to burst your bubble. I just want you to know when your daughter gets into the kind of situation she's about to in Mexico, when she is facing all that's coming her way, I promise this, she will deepen her faith. She will have her values solidified, and most important of all, I bet she will fall deeper in love with her God. I can guarantee that. That's about it. She'll be a lot safer doing that than never learning that God is real and learning how to have compassion on someone, and most importantly, take a God-honoring risk. You want to know how the story ended? Think she went on the trip? She did. She went on the trip. She came back absolutely on fire for the Lord. And she's never been the same since, in a good way, right? She's not like, you know, marred for life or anything with, you know, she, she's not, she's in a good way. She is on fire. And, and we are kidding ourselves if we think we can inoculate ourselves where there's no risks. We are kidding ourselves. That kind of safety is a sham. Let's be honest. We live in a fallen world. At any moment, any moment, something bad could happen to any of us. Right? We're not in fear of that. We just are aware of it. Don't believe me? Check this out right here. In 1919 in Boston, a giant vat of molasses explodes, and it kills 11 people, and it wounds dozens more. Molasses. Think about this. This isn't like, run for your lives. This is a, 
walk slowly for your lives. The molasses, I, but apparently it did great damage in a thing's caught on fire. It must have been horrible. This is a real thing. I bet you didn't try to protect yourself from this this morning, right? All of us risk-averse American Christians. Want another one? Go back 100 years earlier than that. The great London beer flood, I kid you not, there was a vat in a warehouse that exploded. It made three or four other huge vats rupture, and it caused this domino effect that led to the walls giving way, and a 15-foot wall of beer went downtown and drowned seven people. Bet you didn't see that coming. Think about it. Seriously, go, just Google London beer flood. When you, not now. Put your phone down. Google London beer flood when you go home and you can see that. It is incredible. What is the point of this? Christians stop serving because it might not be safe. Yes, there's risk. Yes, there is. But God is calling us to do something. We stop sharing our faith because it might be embarrassing. Oh. We stop giving because oh, I look at my bank. I, we, I can't afford that, Lord. What do you think? And they stop risking because, God, that's dangerous to me. And, you know, we stop asking the great question, God, what do you want me to do? If I truly surrender my life to you, what are you going to do with me? What, what will you do? And you know what happens? We retreat back, and guess what happens to our faith? We don't even know what's happening. It becomes anemic. It becomes apathetic. And it becomes boring. And guess what? Guess what it also becomes? Safe. That elusive thing that we think we want that we think we're striving for. But when you take a risk for God and he comes through for you, he becomes real to you. And he lights a fire in your life, man. You're on a path to rediscovering a faith that is so alive. Is that what you want? Is that what you're here for? Leads us to the last one. Playing it four, play, playing it uh, safe shrivels our hearts. Point number four, if you're taking notes. Playing it safe shrivels our hearts. If you're a Christ follower and you're listening for his voice and you're wanting to get out of the boat and you're wanting to do more for him, Jesus is going to challenge you to do something that seems impossible. He is going to challenge you to get out of your comfort zone. Are you ready for that? Do you even want it? Or have you already folded your arms and said, well, that's not for me, God. That's for my neighbor, right? Because it's safe that way. God, you're not talking to me about this. What if God whispers to you, I want you to go on that mission trip? Our natural, safe response is, God, I can't do that. That's for somebody else. That's risky. I want you to go talk to that person about me and just invite them to come with you. I, I can't do that, God. I'm afraid. I want you to ask forgiveness from that person. Oh, God, can't do that. You know I can't do that. I want you to actually start returning a portion of what I bless you with. <laughs> oh, God, now I know you're crazy. I'm not hearing your voice on that. I want you to lead a small group Bible study. Dig into the Bible. You've been wanting to do it for so long. What is holding you back? God, I don't know how to do that. I can't, I can't do that. I want you to work with junior high students. <laughs> now you're just being funny, God, right? No, I want you to work in the nursery once a month. I want you to, okay, there's probably no God because God would never say that, you know. These, this is what we do, right? These are the things we think. Our faith gets tested and stretched only when we respond to Jesus. Doing us something, ask us to do something that's out of our comfort zone. Is that easy? Not at all. When, when we're not willing to get out of our comfort zone, look at this. This is beautiful. I love this picture right here. Here's us. Here's our comfort zone. Here's where the magic happens, okay? Option A. <laughs> Option B. A. B. I'm your eye doctor. One. Click. Two. Which do you prefer? Where the magic happens. I mean, the clock's ticking, you know? Remember the great, awesome display of <laughs> athleticism I showed? With the, the clock's ticking. The judges are watching, you know. What are we going to lay at his feet when we're done? Are we going to thrust our fists in the air and go, woo scar-free, baby. Where's my mansion? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you could do that. Is that all you got? Well, yeah. It kind of is. Taking a bold step of faith is the alternative to a boring, stagnant faith where we conquer that fear. Sinful patterns of behavior don't get broken when we play it safe. Some of you are facing a bondage, a sin right now that has beset you. There's an author named Greg Lavoie. He wrote this beautiful paragraph. He said, 
What if the abilities and gifts God gave you never get utilized, never get cultivated, never get deployed, until one day the weeks have become months and the months have become years, and suddenly you're looking back on your life wondering about those great deep conversations you never had, wondering about those incredible exhilarating risks he called you to take but you never took, sacrificial gifts he blessed you with that he was calling you to return that you never did, lives that were never touched. And he goes to conclude, not one of us want to end up sitting in our easy chair with our remote and our RC Cola and our Moon Pie, sitting there, watching TV and going, you know what? I'm getting a little bit older and I don't have anything to show for this. And my recliner, as I sit back in this easy chair, this is the most comfortable thing. Oh my goodness, I have a shriveled soul. Because we let apathy sink root into us. We didn't even know it. So what is it that stops us from breaking free from this idol of safety at all cost. This is, this is one of the most beautiful quotes I, I've, I've read in a long time. It says, all of us have vast reservoirs full of potential, but the road that leads to that reservoir is guarded by a dragon of fear. Whew, man, you ready to slay the dragon? Don't do it in the flesh. That's what God has to do. Look at what Jesus did. He took Peter on the adventure of a lifetime. Waves are going crazy, man. This mass hysteria. Dogs and cats are living together. And he is sitting there saying, come, come to me. And he gets out of the boat and he takes a trip that not one of the other disciples gets to do. Why'd they stay there? Because it was safe. It was safe, right? We could look at it and go, okay, well, you know, he, he took it. You know, we stayed in the boat, you know, but he, 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 he sank, right? That's what we love to do. This guy has gotten a, a, a bad rap, some flack here for 2,000 years, right? Peter go, oh, yeah, yeah, Peter, he was, he's, he's the one that started almost drowned, right? He took his eyes off Jesus and he started to fall. We love to point that out. Yo, he got out of the boat. We think about that. That's, that's, a, that's a truth nugget that most of us have heard. At least he got out of the boat. But here's one I bet you haven't heard. And it goes back to the historical context. If you've never heard what really inspired fear in their heart that day, buckle up Dixie Cup. There is a legend, a well-known tradition to all Galilean fishermen. All of them know this. And it is a historical, urban legend. It's almost a ghost story, if you will. And the, the legend, the tradition goes that when you are fishing and you go out at night, remember, they don't have searchlights. They don't have anything. You know, it's like you can see you know, from here to the front row, and that's it, especially in a rainstorm or something. When you're out on a boat and it starts to rock and it starts to get what they think kind of superstitiously a little out of kilter, if you see anything on the water that is unexplainable, it's a warning. It's a bad omen. When you see something that you might not be able to identify, but you think it looks vaguely like a spirit or a ghost, it is, this is what they are taught, what they believe. It is the dead spirit of a fisherman who has died in that spot in a storm like the one you're in because his boat sank to the bottom. Now, knowing that, imagine the fear when they look out and they see, here comes this spirit, this first unidentifiable ghost. It's a ghost coming to warn them, you are in danger. You are about to sink. I died here, and you are about to. You want to talk about creepy. Here's this foggy storm. The rain's coming down. You can see it, and they're rocking. And it's all of a sudden, boom, you can't see it because it's almost right on you. It's a ghost. What is that? And then Peter sees something, and this is amazing. He, he sees something and says, whoa, that's the Lord. And I love this. He says, Lord, look what he does next. I call it the triple whammy. This is, this is like three grenades in a row here, all right? Don't miss this. Once Peter knew it was Jesus, he was bold enough to take action. That's incredible. Are we like that? Once, Jesus, as long as I know it's you, I'll do it. As long as I hear your voice, I will do it. Have you passed that test? Can we move to step two? Look what Peter does next. This is incredible. He realized, he was convinced this was Jesus. It was actually safer walking on the water toward Jesus than it was staying in the boat. What kind of crazy logic is this? That's awesome. All his friends didn't see it that way. They're sitting there like, oh, what are you doing? Get, get, get in the boat. Did they reach for him? They throw him a life preserver? <laughs> they throw him that nice orange, what is it, OSHA looking thing where you got to wear it, you got to buckle it up, you got the little blinking light. They didn't do any of that. Jesus Jesus said, come, and he did. He came out and he obeyed, which led us to the most amazing part of this triple whammy. He kept his eyes on Jesus, and Peter did what no one had ever done, not even the prophets. He walked on the water, and he saw that the difference between fear and faith was his focus. Where was Jesus when he actually walked on the water? Eye to eyeball 
with Peter. Staring, looking at you. Come, I will come. When did Peter fall? When he took his eyes off the Lord. He looked at the wind. How do you look at wind? But he said he saw the wind, not the waves. It was weird. He said, I saw that the wind was boisterous. And he began to sink. Now here's the good news. All of that leads us to some more scripture here that shows us how to dismantle the idol of safety. But I'm going to tell you, none of them are easy. None of them are easy. I've only got time. I'm going to share one of them with you today, and then we'll come back, and I'm going to share the rest of these. The first one that I want you to take with you, it's, it's not easy. Stop saying no to everything just because it scares you. All right? That's your challenge for this week. Stop saying no to everything. Just go, Pray about it. Think about this. This... Let me just leave you with this. When Dr. Rumley began talking to me three or four years ago about retiring and moving to South Carolina, you know what my first reaction was? I seriously, I was like, well, this was good fun. <laughs> this is a great run. I wonder where God's going to move me and my family next. My first reaction. You know why? Because I didn't want to serve with another pastor. I... I've worked with this guy for 14 years, one of my best friends, my mentor, loved this man, loved his family. Just, it, I, I had just gotten him broken in, right? I, I mean, I didn't want to work under another pastor, and I knew I wasn't going to be a pastor. <laughs> Not a chance. You know why? Because it's scary. And if I had obeyed that fear, I would have missed out. Think about it. These last 25 months have been the most rewarding 25 months of my life by far. And I was this close to accepting another position in Notre Dame, up in the cold. Y'all don't know that there was a team sitting on the third row, out of place with their suits and everything, came begging me and my family, go, you need to go. And the minute I said no to that, God's peace came over me and we knew what God was leading us to do. But I had to slay that dragon of fear. It was guarding that reservoir. You know, I'm not saying I'm anything potential, full, or anything like that, but I know I'm where God wanted me to be. These last 25 months have been incredible. Where are you? Do you have a feeling that God's asking you to do something uncomfortable? Start something out of your comfort zone? Launch something? Give something? What is God calling you to do that is outside your comfort zone right now, that you feel that pushing in and you just want to elbow that bubble away from you? What is it that God has laid on your heart that he's tugging the Holy Spirit and he's saying, you ask for this, you give me this, you give me this, I want that. That last unopened door in your heart. What is it that God is laying on it? The next question is, will you be obedient? It's a challenging message. Will we be obedient? Guess what? We get to pray about it right now. Bow with me. God, we give you permission to examine our hearts. Holy Spirit, we invite you to go into every room, every room, open every door, unlock any secret passage. Lord, we want you to invade us so that you have full control of the ship. Lord, if there's something you're calling us to do that is bigger than our faith, Lord, increase our faith. God, if there's something you've called us to do that we have said no to, but you are still there knocking on that, Lord, would you soften our heart? God, I pray for everyone in the sound of this voice. I pray, Lord, you would give them boldness to follow you, just like Peter stepping out of the boat onto <laughs> water, raging sea. Lord, would you do that? Would you increase our faith? Show us the path where you want us to walk, and Lord, we strive to walk that path. In Jesus' name, amen.